I designed my own PCB in KiCad in a very small form factor, combining all those things into a very small package. I can just switch it on and control the color and the effects and uh, if it's just RGB or white and it's very, very simple and very, very great. And if you really enjoy it, then I would be so happy if you could give me a thumbs up or if you didn't like it, thumbs down, which would make me obviously cry. Hi, Bushi here. I love to tinker with electronics and I love lights, especially those indirect ambient ones that give a touch of magic to any place. And that's why I found myself creating a couple of DIY lights over the last couple of years, some of which you can see in the background. And while I love to think about projects, the ideation phase, the design phase, and then finally also the assembly, I have to confess that this nitty gritty assembly of electronics in particular, the endless wiring and putting and repetitive things, putting everything together, isn't really my cup of tea. I prefer to integrate a few components, but components that have some intelligence in them or logic in them. And that's why I got especially excited a couple of years ago when I found out that there are LED, where are they? LED lights that have, or LED strip lights, that have built-in logic per LED. And the only thing you need to control them is not dropping them to the floor, three wires. Okay, here are more, but the essential ones are those three. You need power, you need ground, and you need a control pin. That's it. And you can give each and every LED a single, specific, unique color. How cool is that? Today, there's a plethora of those LED strip lights like this one. They come in different spacings. They come with different configurations for the LEDs that are built in into each and every single one of them, RGB or RGBW with white. Uh, they come with adhesive backing, uh, perfect for any kind of projects that you can immediately start with it. For example, take the one, the orange one in the background, which is uh, using exactly only this one and you can go ahead and start your project. But of course, there's a little more to a light than just a strip. You need a processor, you need power supplies for the strip and also the processor. You need a conversion between the signal level of the processor or the, the microprocessor and the strip. And for that, I designed my own PCB in KiCad in a very small form factor, combining all those things into a very small package and I will come to how I did this in a second. But yet another very important question is how to control this? And for that, I decided to integrate it into my already existing home automation system, which is Home Assistant, and leverage all the great tools uh, and features to control lights. And with that, uh, with the click of a button, if I hit the button, I can just switch it on and control the color and the effects and uh, if it's just RGB or white and it's very, very simple and very, very great. And then the last step is how to, what to run on the microprocessor and how to link it into Home Assistant. And for that, I used ESP Home, a great, fantastic framework for those ESPs. Uh, in this case, it's an ESP module um, and to define in a very small file format, a YAML file, a rather complex program, which is then compiled, flashed to the device, even wirelessly. It's great, it's awesome. Let's dive into it. So in order to start the process of creating my own PCB, I started with creating my own PCB. And for that, I used KiCad. KiCad is an open source, cross-platform PCB software suite that comes organized in a couple of sub-editors schematics editor, symbol editor, PCB editor, footprint, Gerber viewer, image converter, calculate, and so on and so forth. And when we click on schematics, it opens on the wrong monitor. You see that this is the schematics for my board. It's fairly simple. I try to keep the components as few, like limit uh, the number of components uh, to as few as possible. There is the ESP module here. It's an ESP12F which is uh, essentially only a breakout, uh, SMB breakout for the chip, um, the uh, ESP8862. 
all those resistors are just here to bring it an operational state and the only two signals that I'm interested in really are LED signal 3.3 volt and this one here which is the enabler for uh, this circuit here. This circuit is quite important for this board. It takes the battery voltage and that was important to me. I wanted to connect any voltage source uh, that I could think of. It could be 5 volts, it could be for AAA or AA batteries, it could be a LiPo. And I wanted to connect this here and without any problems have 5 volts at the end, at the output, with a minimum 1.5 amps. Um, reason for that is because the strips uh, get quite long. They have at least three, if not four LEDs per LED component, LED chip. And that sums up quite rapidly if you pump the, the light output to the maximum, uh, sums up to quite high amps uh, quickly. This is a, uh, a Texas Instruments a boost circuitry with a coil, a quite efficient one actually, and I was searching quite a long time to narrow it down to this and then selected that for the board. The other components are only uh, the level conversion between the 3.3 signal level output of the ESP converting it to 5 volts and then last but not least I have a linear voltage regulator to convert from the battery output which should always be more than 3.3 volts uh, to 3.3 for the ESP and that's it basically. Now all the rest is that is for flashing here um, and then I have only two connectors to connect the strip and the yeah, batteries. When we jump into the PCB editor Uh, it looks like a bit of a mess that can be reduced if we narrow it down to one layer first. This is the upper side, or like what's called upper side. It is organized in sections. So this one is the 5 volt um, boost circuitry that boosts from voltage battery, battery voltage to 5 volts. Um, here is the 3.3 generation for the ESP, and down here is the level conversion. And that's basically it. This is only pin header for flashing. And then we have the battery and the strip connections. And then on the upper side, the only component that is, uh, sorry, on the bottom side, and let me disable that, is the footprint for the ESP module. And that's it. So as you can see, very simple. Keep it, keep it simple, stupid, right? So I wanted to, I wanted it to be as small as possible to fit in different applications, and as simple uh, but yet as confined and uh, concise and uh, everything necessary on that board. Of course, also two drills to mount it in place uh, in any application, because that's the worst thing you want, or you can, <laughs> worst thing you want, right? It's the worst thing that you can think of. You have the PCB, everything is working, but you cannot really mount it properly into the final application. That just sucks. All right, so once I was done with this, I packed it all together, I zipped it and sent it out. Um, I used for the manufacturer JLC PCB, they come, they come from China to me personally. They are sitting in China. Uh, you would think it takes forever to get something out there and then ship back to you, but actually it's quite swift. And now I can finally show you the parcel that I was showing off uh, some, some time ago and projects coming up. And part of that now finally arrived, but I will not show you now what's in this uh, nice brown brown box. This is in the box. Bags. So we have, those are the boards. I also created those flash PCBs, which is essentially a, a small PCB breakout of a cable they can be connected to a cable and pogo pins can be soldered in place such that you can hold the flash adapter onto the board, press the button, uh, the ESP goes, it is reset and goes into flash mode and you can flash it once and then you forget this and never go back to it hopefully because you can update over the air. So once I got the PCBs delivered to me, I anxiously sat down, organized my workbench and then got down to the task of soldering the components onto the PCB. I was quite scared, I have to say, about this step. 
because the uh, some of the components are really really tiny um, and there is even one component the coil it has the pads underneath the part and there is no exposed outside area where you can actually solder to which means that you have to put the paste onto the pcb put the component on top of it and then just have to hope that the connection uh, that is then uh, done while you heat it up with hot air is done in a way that there's no short and it's also not too little uh, soldering paste that it connects to the PCB properly. As this is the like a component that has to handle a lot of current and is vital for the functioning of the PCB, I was really scared. But to be honest, my fear was not really necessary because of one thing that I changed in the process prior to all my soldering adventures in the, in the past, and that is flux. So in the past, I was virtually never really uh, using additional flux except for the flux that is already included in the solder. Tin usually or solder paste has also some flux in there. But I was applying in, in my terms quite a lot of extra flux which helped in removing the surface tension of the, of the solder tin and make it's kind of magic you know it's it just keeps the solder paste and uh, the solder tin in the right positions keeps them out of positions where, the, where they should not go. It's a little bit like magic. And if you do it right, you can just dump chips onto the heated PCB with a lot of flux and, and soldering uh, tin or solder paste. And they swim on top of the flux into the right positions until the, the surface tension of the solder tin, solder, solder paste, solder tin, uh, I guess, uh, is pulling them in place. And then it's this relief it's this rewarding feeling where you can see that it slides in place and then you can you can stop heating up and everything is perfect and that was and it was like this in my case there was one little problem during the soldering that i realized that one of the components didn't fit uh, onto the footprint on the pcb either i ordered the wrong piece the wrong model the wrong footprint or uh, the footprint was messed up during the footprint design stage. Uh, long story short, I was able to put it in such a way onto the board that the pins somehow connected. It's not the best and perfect job that I ever did, but it worked and let's keep it like this. All right, so the next step in the process was to bring software onto the ESP boards that are just assembled. If you have played with microcontrollers in the past, you know that they are quite powerful and they can do anything and everything but to do something meaningful can actually take a quite long amount of time but not so with esp home esp home is just great it is a framework to create programs for the esps in a very simple form in form of a text file a yaml file and then you can pick and grab and combine all the different tools that are already available and combine it into one program and let it compile and then flash to the device or even upload wirelessly to your board. It's just so, so great. And basically, virtually, there is a module that you can pick and include for virtually anything and everything. So that's now my instance of ESP Home running on my Pi. And I have a couple of lights defined here and if we when we look into one of those lights this is all that is to it to create and create a software for my light and make it work it is so awesome so at first you give it a name you define what esp version you are currently using that's a module esp 12e and in this case uh, i think that is pin compatible to f and s i wanted to enable the logger I gave it an API uh, encryption key. I defined an over-the-air password for over-the-air updates after the first flashing. I told it how to connect to my local, or actually only this one, uh, I, to I told it how to connect to my local Wi-Fi. And then I defined that it should be a light yeah, of the type of NeoPixel bus uh, in the orientation, so that's the order of LEDs inside of each and every single LED. So first comes the green, then comes the red, then comes the blue, then, then the white. Uh, it is this variant, so that is the type of this particular uh, strip light. This is a very important 
information because it tells ESP, the ESP home environment, when it compiles the program on which pin this light should send its data. And that is the exact pin that I de defined on the uh, board that I created. And I also gave it the number of LEDs. So how many LEDs are daisy chained on this strip light that's attached and gave it a name. This name we will later see, this is also represented in a home assistant. And then one more component, which is a switch. It's a platform GPIO, so virtually it exposes a switch to home assistant. And that pin was also visible in my schematics. And that is driving the output of the five volts. So I made it in such a way that I can have the ESP running, but without the power elements enabled to save battery power if I don't need it. And that is going out on pin five. And this switch is called Bushy Light for enable, as an enable pin. And then I also added something else, which is a platform shutdown, which is an internal component that lets me shut down the ESP completely when I want to, to put it into a very low power saving state. So I said that you only need to connect to the board the first time when you flash it, the first very time, and every subsequent one will be over the air. Now guess what, you can also connect to the different boards and I have currently this one in front of me that is up and running um, and I can show me the locks of this wirelessly. So it now connects to this, which is running. Ah, I selected the wrong one. Uh, I should have gone to this one, five, wirelessly, connects to it and now it shows me the output of this running ESP. And now I could, for example, go over to my home assistant and flip the enable pin for the five volt generation. And you can see it here, live being represented as a lock entry. And then I can go to the light and set it to 15% and switch it on. Or let's make it actually brighter, 65. You can see that I uh, it reports that I put it to 65%. And that's it. Now I could change the, the YAML file and flash actually a new version to it. Just like this, having it in my hand, not having to worry about any pin connections or in what order do I need to put it or if the pogo pins are not connecting perfectly. All this is nonsense. You don't need to worry about it. You update live over the air. It is so great. Last step in the process, how to control the light. And for that, obviously I was using, I'm using Home Assistant. Adding an ESP Home into Home Assistant is as easy as going to Settings, Devices and Services, Add Integration, and then type in ESP, ESP Home. You type in how the host is named and the port. You hit Submit. You maybe enter the API key and that's it. And connect. And then back, back, back. You end up with something like this. All the components that are defined in ESP Home are represented one-to-one -one here in Home Assistant. So for example, here you see the switch that I was talking earlier, the enable switch. I need to flip this, otherwise there's no five volts for the strip. And then I can, for example, enable the light. And there you go. And now I can leverage all the great control features of Home Assistant to, for example, change the color. It's a bit hard to see because I was cranking it up, maybe in my face. Because I cranked up the output power so, so high. You can switch it off. For example, now if I cut the power, it goes off, surprise. And okay, this one doesn't have any effects defined. Uh, yeah, right, as we saw, but uh, those effects would uh, show up here. Those effects are defined by ESP Home, but that is something like, for example, rainbow or flickering or fireworks. You can even define your own custom ones and so on and so forth. I could even go so far as to add the logic whenever I enable this color here or this light, this one flips automatically. And that can be done in ESP Home or in Home Assistant, whatever you prefer. And that concludes this project. It was something that was accompanying me for quite some time in the last couple of months. 
I was not full, working, of course, full time on that, but uh, still designing the PCB, checking it over and over, sending it out, getting it back, putting the components on the, soldering the components onto the PCB, then flashing it, making sure everything works and reaching this step made me actually quite happy. And then I wanted to have all, you know, all of the boards that I had uh, and pieces for assembled for this video. Realizing that I had too little or too few lithium batteries, ordering more with protection circuits, realizing that those are longer than those and they don't fit at all in any of the holders that I had at my disposal. In the end, I gave up and just made the video like is right now. And if you now say that uh, it's a cool project, I would actually try uh, something like this myself. Uh, I have a couple of spares here. I don't need those. If you are interested, check the description box down below uh, where you can find details of how to get hold of some of those. And if you like this video, then you know I am Bushy. And if you really enjoyed it, then I would be so happy if you could give me a thumbs up. Or if you didn't like it, thumbs down, which would make me obviously cry and go die or go dying. But if you give me a thumbs up, I would be laughing out loud, rolling on the floor. Uh, by the way, this is one of uh, the other lights that I built quite some time ago. It has also an ESP, but not this PCB board, all assembled by hand. But I'm planning on rehauling this. So if you're interested to see the details of this, uh, keep on watching for one of the next videos. Yeah, with this, I uh, leave you to it. Have a good one. It was a great project. Now it's concluded. I'm happy. See you soon. Bye.